Hello and welcome to Show and Tell with David Perel and Ana Lorena Fabrega. Uh, we were talking before we started, and Ana can't pronounce socialization. <laughs> we're going to be talking about homeschooling today. That is not today. true. Try, try That's to do it. That's not true. Do it. Socialization. There you go. That I was like an time. eight out of ten. Eight no. out of ten. Oh my gosh. Okay. Socialization. Socialization. And Say apparently... ferrocarril, David. Say ferrocarril. Go ahead. Let me hear you. Ferrocarril. Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> we're talking about homeschooling today, and we're going to start with, you guessed it, show and tell. What did you bring today? My item for today, since we're talking about homeschooling, and one of the big benefits of homeschooling is that you get to mold and shape the curriculum around the emerging interest of the kid, I decided to bring a... Sand dollar. Yes, a sand dollar. And again, I'm at the beach. So the reason why I brought this is because well, homeschooling is all about learning from the real life and in real context, right? Or at least it's supposed to be. So let's say that you go out on a walk with your kids that you're homeschooling and on the beach and you come across a sand dollar. The kids are going to have so many questions and they'll probably be, say something like, oh my gosh, look at that pretty shell with that star shaped stamped on one side. And you can go ahead and clarify and say, well, no, this is actually a sand dollar and it's a type of invertebrate marine animal. And it's actually relative of starfish and of the sea orchids. So you can go ahead and explain that. And it's coming again organically for something that they found. Um, and they may ask, well, why does it look like a shell if it's not a shell? And you can go ahead and explain where actually when the sand dollars are alive, they're not white like this. They're actually purple. And they have like this fuzzy little things and spines Whoa. that they use in order to get their food, right? But when they die, they die. Their skeletons get bleached by the sun. And that's why they turn white. You can go ahead and explain that they're actually carnivores, why they're called sand dollars. The kid will obviously ask why they're called sand dollars. Why? You can say, well... People back then thought that they looked like a large silver coin and it reminded them of like the American or the Spanish dollar back then. Um, and you can talk about, you know, where you find this kind of um, marine animals. You can you find them in the tropical waters. So there's a lot of like, do you see how much learning there's going on yeah. here and how much potential for like more learning there is from something that you come across walking on the beach? And that's the whole point, because this is the kind of learning that sticks and again, I was the third and fourth grade teacher and I would teach about this and I would introduce sand dollars, but it was completely different. I did it, okay, today we're talking about marine animals and invertebrates, go ahead and open your textbook. This is the page and they would see a picture. That learning is less likely to stick than this kind of learning when kids actually find it in real context and are curious and that's when they start learning. So that's my show and tell for today. What is your that show and tell? That was really good. That was Thank really good. Thank you, David. Seven on the show and tell item, 10 on the explanation. Okay, fine. I'll take it. We should I meant do that a as a compliment. I meant that as a compliment. Okay, this is mine. So I believe that one of the things that I think is really interesting about where learning is going is if you have passion for something, you don't need a curriculum to, to go learn it. And that if you have somebody who's just obsessed with something with all the tools of the internet that they have – and this is why I'm so excited about homeschooling, especially for kids who have that innate drive and curiosity. Um, and so when I was a kid, what I was obsessed with was getting cool baseball memorabilia. So I have two show and tell items, but part of the same thing. So what I would do is I would go, and this one's sort of the less exciting one, but like I have a baseball that's autographed by a lot of people on the San Francisco Giants. And so I would go to games and for years years i would never leave the stadium until i caught a baseball so my best baseball catching story is and like these weren't like catching it off the bat but i would go and i'd try to get them from the players so i went to wrigley field in chicago when i was in like probably fourth grade and the astros were playing the cubs and we were sitting by the astros bullpen like where all the players hang out and I knew that. So what I did was I bought an Astros hat in Chicago for the Cubs game. And because I remember Darren Oliver was the starting pitcher that day. And because I was the only fan who was wearing the Astros hat, I walked out with seven baseballs that night. And all the other kids were like, how did you do that? Like most people don't even catch seven baseballs in their life. So I got really good and I like mastered the art of catching baseballs. Like I literally caught hundreds. But then I was like – 
catching baseballs actually isn't that exciting. So then I used to get broken bats. And so this was a broken bat <laughs> from a guy named Rich Aurelia. And so what I would do is I would go to the dugout and I would pay attention to who broke their bat during the game. And then I would go to the people in the Giants dugout and I would say, give me your bat. And these are probably worth hundreds of dollars. I have them I all over the place. Me. And uh, that's my homeschooling little kid story. That was really good. And I did not know that about you. Very persistent kid, right? You were Very obsessed persistent. with that. So you would go, yeah, you would go for those. That is hilarious. I'm just like super persistent. I think I learned that as a kid, like, you know, getting these baseballs, getting these bats, like you don't need somebody to teach you these things. You can just sort of mm -hmm. figure things out. And I think that when it comes to school, like a lot of the curriculum sort of implies like these are the things that you should know and the other stuff is kind of worthless and not that valuable. But I think that a lot of schooling and a lot of learning, not schooling, like schooling and learning aren't the same thing. I think that that's a really good place to begin this conversation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of learning just happens at home. So I'm curious, what is it for you about homeschooling that why don't you sort of begin this conversation? I'll sort of flow with you. Well, I'm a big fan of homeschooling, and I actually think that homeschooling is taking off for several reasons, and we can talk about those later. But um, the thing that, that really draws me to homeschooling is that kids and parents really get to like devise their own curriculum together. And that's when it starts to go from like education, like you were saying, to, to real learning, right? Because you together you start to pick and choose the things that are really valuable and how you want to do it. Um, I also really like the fact that it's a parents have um, and kids like a very flexible approach in terms of timing and assessment. So I don't know about you, but I, I am a morning person. But my sister, for example, is not a morning person. And the fact that we both had to be up and sitting down in the classroom at 730, I was probably absorbing everything at that time. But my sister's probably not absorbing everything at that time. Right. Because we have different timings in terms of how we work. Um, so the fact that homeschooling does provide this like flexible approach to timing and the approach of assessment, right? You don't need to do all this test. You can tell if your kid is learning with other ways that are more flexible too. Um, then also the fact that you can move at their own pace according to all the kids, you know, learning styles and their interest. And what I mentioned at the beginning with the sand dollar, that you can mold and shape the curriculum around the emerging interest of the kid. And this is so powerful because that's when real learning happens not when you force the kid or you try to force the kid to learn because you can't really force anyone to learn you can force them to memorize something but not to learn so those are really the first things that come to mind and i'm like whoa like homeschooling really provides and again i was a teacher for many years and i'm and i'm much more in favor of this kind of learning experience not education um but then again of course, there's some challenges that come with this. And I don't know if you know you want to talk about them or if you want for me to talk about them. Well, a couple comments. So I really like the idea that memorization is not learning. I think that a lot of what's happened in education and the place where it's gone wrong is that we've taken things that weren't the same word and then we've equated them as the same idea. So it's like, yeah, we want kids to learn and memorization is a byproduct of learning. Therefore, mm. let's just not focus on learning, only focus on memorization. And because memorization is a byproduct of learning, then they'll actually learn. But what you realize is that's kind of path dependent. Like there's mm -hmm. two kinds of memorization. There's like pre-learning memorization and then there's post-learning memorization. And post-learning memorization is a lot more valuable, right? Like I never memorized how to go catch baseballs, but if I walk into a stadium, I can just know exactly how to like game the system of the way a, uh, a stadium is set up. And then when it comes to homeschooling, I remember, so big scooter guy, big scooter guy. So like, unfortunately, the two cities that I live in the most, like I was living in New York and my family lives in San Francisco, not big scooter cities. And so whenever I go to LA, whenever I go to Washington, DC, whenever I go to Austin, Texas, I scoot around. And I might have told this story before, but I was in DC and I was scootering and we went by all the Smithsonian museums, the Museum of Natural History, or, or the, the, the Natural History Museum that is in DC. Um, no, I'm thinking National Geographic Museum. And I went by and I was like, if I was a kid, because all the museums in DC are free, I was like, if I was a kid, 
then my homeschooling could just be going to museums and that would just be better than school. And I think that there's something within this of like the agency of homeschooling. Like what would be so cool about this isn't necessarily that you're homeschooling, but it's as simple as I want to learn this today. What is the best way to do that? And the thing is so often we're like, oh, you know, you need the curriculum. That's no different from how I learn. Like no mm -hmm. different. The way I learn is I sit down at my computer and I'm like, what do I feel like reading right now? And then I do projects and learning is the byproduct of those things. And those are the ways that I would focus on learning. It's why I like homeschooling. Absolutely. And you know what that reminds me of? I've, I've been having some conversations with some moms that do homeschooling just because I'm trying to really like get into this vibe because um, I'm really interested in it. And one of the things that one of the moms mentioned was that the that is very different from school, that she takes Saturdays to plan with her two girls, right? One is seven years old and the other one's nine. So on Saturdays, they take about an hour and a half and they have, they don't talk about, you know, grades because she doesn't consider their kids to be in grades like in school, but she does have like a, the curriculum that one of the schools, you know, follows just so that she kind of has a sense of what kids that are the age of her, of her daughters are supposed to be learning. And then together with the kids, she'll kind of like pull the things that she finds relevant and that she knows that the kids are going to need. And then the kids decide, you know, when they want to learn this, like, okay, we need to learn all these things. What do you want to learn about next week? And then the kids have that agency and they say, Oh, I'm really interested in this. So that's what she's like in homeschooling. You need to take advantage of those excitement moments. Like when the kid says, I want to learn about that. Boom. You, you, you have the interest, you have the motivation, you go with that. It's very different from school, right? In school, it's like, this is what we're learning today. And if it happens to match your interest, good for you, but that's not very common, right? So I love this idea of involving the kids in the planning on Saturdays and then just kind of like, you know, uh, like saying, what, what are we going to learn each day? And then she says that this also helps with that battle of, oh, today we're going to be learning this in math. No, the kid was the one who decided, okay, I want to learn this on Wednesday and I'm curious about this. So it starts to work very nicely in that way. And she also mentioned that she's very, very flexible in, the, in, in terms of if one day the kid is very curious about something that was not in the schedule, she will put everything aside and then just focus on that thing that the kid wants to learn about. Because again, the kid is interested and that's what you need in order for learning to stick. But parents kind of have this idea or this misconception that homeschooling, you need to be at home for seven hours with your kid going over the textbook and this and that, but no, like learning can be today we're going to the Met Museum, today we're gonna go to this place and, and it can happen outside, it can be walking on the beach, like there's so many ways for learning to happen, right? For real learning to happen. So I really like sure. that idea of excitement moments because mm -hmm. I get those all the time. Like I'll just get excited about something and boom, let's just do it. And sometimes I could be a little too fast in order to do stuff. But I think that's why I'm action oriented. And mm -hmm. like for me, that is what makes learning fun. And people for with our personality types, like we just get excited about things. And then boom, we just sort of roar and just roll with that excitement. Um, beyond that... A uh, couple comments. So I'm reminded of a conversation. I had a friend from college. His name was Brett Spelker. And mm -hmm. Brett lived in a town west of New York called Madison, New Jersey. And I went to go visit Brent, Brett because I uh, just stayed with him for the weekend. And I ended up talking to his 10-year-old brother. And it was really interesting because he knew so much about history, like more than any adult I've met 10 years old. And he could name you like he went on this this tirade about the origins of World War One. And I was like, how do you know all this? And he said, well, whenever I try to learn something, I start with this YouTube channel called Crash Course, which is amazing. Uh -huh. I even like Crash Course. And then I, I just learn, 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 learn. And then I like go down other parts of YouTube and I just learn about history. And what's interesting is I feel like there's this dichotomy within homeschool of like you want kids to do what they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I think that we agree on that. But the place that people have some trepidation is, wait, what about the common knowledge that a society needs or that kids need and stuff like that? This is probably the most controversial thing I'll say today, but I would rather start with the curiosity and work back towards the common than start with the common and then try to get people to be curious. And I feel like we want both in a society, but right now we start with the common and then we hope and pray for curiosity. But the thing is, I feel like in order to be part of a society, 
you want that kind of common knowledge and if you are curious you'll then ladder back to that now with that said there are certain countries and like we could have a conversation that i think is beyond the scope of this of like how important is it for all americans to have shared mythology or all panamanians to have shared stories and for everyone to know the national anthem i don't know i mean i think that that's an interesting conversation but right now what i'm seeing is people go to preschool then they go to 12 years of k through 12 then they go Mm -hmm. to another four of college and they're still not ready to work a job in a professional market and i'm not even sure that the outcomes are that good so what i do know is the system right now i don't even think is on the right track and like when people say oh education needs more money needs more money look that's not it like education at this point for the most part does not need more money like it is fundamentally on the wrong basic assumptions and axioms of how we should be teaching kids and what i really like about the homeschooling conversation is even if it it doesn't give us the right answer like this is exactly what we should do it's directionally very accurate i am going to 200 percent agree with your controversy and i was thinking about this like a few days ago david that kid that is a skilled thinker and an adept learner that can adjust to whatever the future throws at that kid. What I mean is like that kid that had nurtured that curio- like that curiosity over, you know, memorizing facts or like learning in that way can like spackle those holes. Let's say that she has like some holes in her knowledge or he has some holes in his knowledge and he knows how to acquire the skills that he or she needs in order to do the things that they want to do. But if you have that other kid who, you know, just shoveled down his preparedness and but lost his curiosity, whose, you know, interests are just like, uh, like they just, the kid doesn't even know what they're interested in and are just replaced by like this general things that we need to teach in school. That kid is going to have a really hard time, you know, coming out of that. Because I, I just prefer a kid that's very curious and has a few holes in knowledge and knows what to do than that kid that memorized a bunch of things but lost that curiosity or just doesn't have that desire to learn that, for example, you and I have or that excitement about things, right? So... I totally agree that it's more important to nurture that curious, that curious side of the kid um, over like trying to overwhelm them with content. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing I'm interested in is like there's there's sort of inflection points in the world. And when you get an inflection point, I think that you should look at something because something is about to change. So if we went back to 2008 and I would say, hey, I'm going to have a car pick me up at my house, going to take me across the city, and they'll show up to my house, private driver, private driver, I'll have the entire car to myself, they'll show up to my house within five minutes, and uh, I can pick a standard car, or I could pick a luxury car, and I could get all these different kinds of amenities, and guess what, it's such a premium service, I don't even have to give them my cash, I just walk right out without exchanging any money, they'd be like, damn, like, give me the number of that limousine company. That's just Uber. This is like a standard part of the modern world. And a limousine company would have been very high-end, very expensive. The same thing is about to happen to homeschooling. That what the internet is really good above everything else is it's a matching tool. Where it finds the needle in the haystack. It finds the person or the idea that is perfectly on your wavelength in a world of abundance. So Google goes out and searches the entire internet and gives you exactly what you want. If you go out and you search David Perel on Google, you will go exactly to my website. Then you'll see Rite of Passage right next to it. Amazing. The same thing is about to happen in in homeschooling, where until now, economic challenges, just like the limo, have prevented homeschooling from taking off. But in part because I'm an investor in one, in part because I have friends working on this, there are all these homeschooling startups that are allowing people to pool resources together for homeschooling. The technology of smartphones and computers finally gotten cheap enough. And my prediction, my prediction is within the next 10 to 15 years, homeschooling, which is now seen as a luxury good. Oh, you have the money? that one of your parents doesn't need to go work and can stay home. It's not how it's going to be anymore. Mm -hmm. It is going to just be an alternative option. Yes, it will cost money, but
but the cost of it might go down 10x. And if a cost goes down 10x, the market can expand dramatically. Yeah. And then also the fact that um, there are more parents nowadays working from home and like working remotely. And you can, there are ways, especially with, you know, companies like Primeer that are like making it really simple, like for parents to homeschool. There is a possibility now, it is possible for parents to work from home and homeschool, especially because it's a myth that Good you need point. to teach your kids for seven hours a day. Like I've spoken to plenty of homeschool parents and they're like, this is a myth and it needs to be debunked. Like kids need, a, like when they're in first grade, max an hour and a half of direct learning a day. That's it. When they're in third and fourth grade, maximum three hours a day. And the rest of the learning happens in unstructured ways. They happen when the kids are playing, they happen when the kids are building something, when the kids are making a video and spending hours editing, when they go to the museum, when they go out to play, when they start you know, participating in sports, when they go to music and art class. Like There are so many ways in which the kids are learning after that one hour and a half or two or three hours of direct instruction. So that frees up the afternoon for the parents to do other things and work, um, and the kids are still learning, but in more organic ways. So that's one part, right? Also the fact that the cost of traditional education continues to rise, it just does. And the cost of alternative education is actually going down, but the quality of, for example, online courses and other forms of alternative education is going up. So when you think about it, it makes sense. And especially now that we're like living this remote life to keep your kids at home and do it in a way that benefits them and also benefits you and it's more cost effective. So there's also like that part. And it also reminds me of, you know, many parents when they hear this, they're like, okay, I buy into that, but what about the socialization? Did I say it correctly? The kids being social, kind good of. Good enough, good enough okay. to keep going. Well done. Okay. I will teach the pronunciation homeschooling oh, course. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. In English, I'll do the Spanish or Portuguese. So I can people already want... roll my R, so. <laughs> so, see, I got the Spanish one down too. Verdad, si. People want for their kids to be social, right? Like, that's a big thing for them. And, well, obviously, and for them to be able to like interact and live in the real world. But I think it's so funny, like to me, this is one of the myths of homeschooling and it can be debunked so easily because when you think about it, first in school, there's not a lot of socialization going on. Like there really isn't, thank you. There really isn't. Like kids, you know, when you ask kids like, well, when is the time where you're most socializing with your friends? They'll tell you in the bus. Like what? You know, in the class, the teachers will even tell you, you're not here to socialize, you're here to learn. Okay, mm. so they're not really socializing in classes. We've talked about how now many schools are doing quiet lunches, which I think it's ridiculous, but it's part of their, you know, like behavior control. Recess across the, you know, globally is being, cut off, like it's shorter and shorter and shorter. Like when I was a third grade teacher, there was a year when recess was 15 minutes. Like that's insane. In 15 minutes, you you don't have time for anything. You literally, especially... you get to the playground, figure out the rules and, of the game and, and, and it's over. Out. Yeah, so there is not a lot of socialization going on in school, but when you are being homeschooled, not only are you interacting like with, you have many possibilities to interact, but also you're interacting with people of different ages. Like in real life, you're not just, talking and interacting with kids your age, right? Here you get to talk to, you know, that teacher that comes to teach cooking lessons on Wednesdays and she's older than you and you're interacting with her. You get to interact with the people in the museum that you went to. You get to go to the playground because again, you have all this flexibility and time that's free to play during the day because direct instruction is limited to a few hours. You go ahead and you're in sports, you are in, um, you know, other extracurricular activities. So really like there's so many opportunities for you to socialize. So that's like another myth that's going around that I'm like, mm-mm. No, like that may be before, but now that's not really a thing. I have a question, and honestly, this is a question. I don't know the answer to it. Here's what I would be very curious about. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that this gets into our last myth of homeschooling, which is that homeschoolers are at a disadvantage when trying to enter top universities and jobs. Mm -hmm. So hold that idea, but mm -hmm. here's my question. So socialization basically is a one-way spectrum where the closer you get to socialization, the better. That's how we think about it. Like you're either not socialized or you are socialized. And mm -hmm. what socialized basically means is I'm good enough at like 
understanding what other people want and sort of mimic it, mimicking culture that I can get along with people and it can work out well. So like if you're not socialized, you're like not good at it and you're just sort of like a freak or a geek or a weirdo. And then like once you get to socialization, like you can work with other people. But I actually am not sure that that's how it plays out. I think that you want to be socialized enough where you can get along, you can have a good conversation, you can date, you can have really close friendships, you can love your family, have a great conversation. No doubt about it whatsoever. You can work with other people. But I actually think that there's a way in which you can be over-socialized. And over-socialized means that you conform, that you do what other people tell you to do, that you just sort of go along with the crowd. And once again, I don't even know that this model is true. It's just my hypothesis. Because what, like, like you and I have a friend named Hannah Franklin. And mm -hmm. Hannah was homeschooled. And Hannah, I really like Hannah because if we have a conversation, it flows, it's easy, she's, she's good to talk to. But she also has all these kooky, weird, like one of a kind ideas that are so uniquely hers. And I think that like in one very important way, she's actually under socialized. And I think it's really valuable for her. Um, I, well, again, I know Hannah well too. And, and I, one of the things that makes her so unique is that she's a big, big time reader. So that's like maybe a component in this, you know, um, equation with her, but also, um, I feel like, like she has, she's one of those people that has had the opportunity to bond and, and socialize in different ways, like not just with people in a classroom her age. So that's why, you know, she's the way, and I also enjoy, she has so many topics of conversations and, and it's interesting because I'm a, I'm a big talker and she's also a big talker, but, but, but in a different way, she loves asking questions. She's so curious. She loves asking questions so and this curious. and that. Yeah. And, and it's just, it, you're right. I had never thought about like the spectrum and, and socialization in that way. Um, but, but I find it interesting. I, I feel like. Right. But that's how you the, are, right? Like, yeah. I mean, that's why I like you because you like, you're not socially awkward in any way, <laughs> but like you are. <laughs> always have original ideas when we talk about school and the reason why when you were one of my rite of passage students where i was like yes let's do it was because you always had original perspectives but honestly i feel like if you go all the way and you follow the logical end of socialization you just end up being so socialized that you're like the average of everybody and you don't want that mm. yeah yeah i can see that you just start you grab from everything and you're just kind of imitating other people. I never thought about that. I like that. And let, well, let's now go back to that last myth that you, that you talked about. And I actually did my research on this um, because I've been hearing around, yeah, like my, if I homeschool my kids, they're not gonna have like the same opportunities as kids that go to school to, you know, go into top universities and then go into good jobs. Here is what I found. I found that, and I'm gonna talk about four top universities. Oxford welcomes applications from students who have been homeschooled. MIT has a long history of accepting homeschoolers and they actually don't require a high school diploma or a GED from their applications, which I found really interesting. This is from their websites. Princeton welcomes applications from homeschoolers and Harvard, this is really interesting. In Harvard, homeschooling is an educational asset that they consider favorably when making their admission process. So clearly it's a myth that Kids are not going to be able to, you know, make it to universities if, you know, they even want to do that by the time they get there. So, so that aside, you know, maybe you can talk about, you know, getting jobs. Like I, I don't think that if you're homeschooled, you're going to have any issues either getting jobs. Like it's just, you did not get educated in a classroom. You got educated in the real world. To me, that's an asset, right? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, I'd want to look into that data a little bit, a little bit more. My, my baseball <laughs> hit my headphones. Good job, David. So I want to look into that data a little bit more because I'd want to know like what percentage of kids are homeschooled and what percentage of kids go to Harvard. But still, like, let's just be honest here. Like the point of life is not to go to Harvard. And the God- Don't tell that to my husband. The God of American <laughs> childhood is literally college. And I'm not- I'm not trying to say that Harvard is a bad thing. Like, that's not my point at all. Harvard rocks. I know that your husband went to Harvard, MBA, all that sort of stuff. But like, I mean, is the goal even to get a job? Like, you know, like you could just go and like college to get a job, a job to live a good life. And like, mm -hmm, also, mm -hmm. 
what about the 20 years that you spend just as a kid in school? Like, are we not going to value those? Like, say that you do marginally, and I don't believe this is the case, but say that you do marginally worse as a as a homeschooled child after you leave school. You do 5% worse, okay? But 20 or 25% of your life is spent in school. So say that school itself is way better. Even if you do worse later, if you took like, like, like using a very sort of utilitarian sense on this, like what are the total like po happiness points that I get in my life? Say that you just enjoy your childhood way more from homeschooling. There's actually a level in which you could have post-life be worse and it would still be worth it. And like, uh, mm -hmm. it's like, are we going to obsess so much over your job and what happens then so that you can have a good retirement? Like, no. How about like maximizing the now, having an amazing childhood? And like, there's certain kids like me who just aren't cut out for school. And like of me. us. And like, there's a lot of us in the world. So any I, closing comments um, yeah. as we finish off here? Yes, that, well, just with finishing up what you're saying, I really do feel like many kids, like kids nowadays that are leveraging the internet and becoming citizens of the internet and learning about the things that they're interested in and not what, you know, they only being stuck to school. I really feel like those kids are not going to need to continue that conventional path of going to college and getting a job. They're going to be creating their own jobs before they graduate from um, high school. Like I am really convinced because I think about myself and how curious I am I'm on how I have this, this work ethic and all this energy. Had I started doing all this when I was, you know, 10, oh my God, I wouldn't be here right now. I feel like I wasted so many years and so much potential in school. And I am hoping that with all that's going on, more kids get an opportunity to start earlier. And we're going to be surprised. Like this is my prediction, you know, like we're going to look five years from now, 10 years from now, and we're going to have so many kids working for themselves before they graduate high school. Like, I really believe that. And doing Guess things what? that they like. We what? knocked it out of the park today. Ah, yes, we did. But with a broken bat. <laughs> with a broken bat. But we're still hitting homers. I love it. Boom, I love boom, it. boom, boom. Great session. Another episode of Show and Tell is in the books. Hey, we want to hear from you. So um, let us know in the comments what you're interested in. We'll try to get back to you and respond as fast as we can. But thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.